as you know, <clears throat> I do interim pastor work. Some of you know that. Uh, I've spoken here before. And uh, I was in Kansas for the last eight months and uh, in Hutchinson, Kansas. And the church that I worked with, they were without a pastor. And their pastor had retired after 19, 20 years of being in the ministry. And so one of the things that happened is that I was to go in and train the search team, the pulpit committee. That's what I do. I've been working with churches. You guys had IPM working with you when, when you called Troy. And so that was the things I've done. I've done several churches. And this particular church was a great church. It's, it was one of the best churches I've ever been in. Hutchison Bible Church. Actually, it's not that. It's a, I can't even remember the name now. I go through so many churches. But it's a Bible church. It's an evangelical Bible church in Hutchinson. And the interesting thing is that most of the people that went to that church were German descent. And most of them also not only German descent, but they were Mennonites. And many of them also, some of them were from some other, uh, they were what? The ones that wear the long beards and stuff like that. What's those? Uh, yes, Amish. A lot of Amish there. But what was really great about it, they said, we know people, I was telling them about my son being in Dallas, Oregon. They said, we know the people in Dallas, Oregon. There's several, several of them said, so we have relatives in this church. And I said, you really do? They said, yeah. He says, yeah, they're, they're Mennonites and that's our background. And many of them shared with me the struggles that the Mennonites went in were having when they were in Prussia and in Lithuania and different places like that and how they had struggled for the faith. How that they were kicked out of their countries, kicked out of Russia, kicked out of Germany, kicked out wherever they went. And finally, they settled in America. And I will tell you, you have a rich heritage. And you know, it's really interesting. My wife, you know, she's a full-blood German. Uh, their, their family came over in the 1880s, and, and they never married anybody but Germans. You know, they settled up in Wisconsin where the Germans are and also certain places in Illinois. And so... All the kids always married Germans until my wife and uh, the other brothers, when they finally, you know, a hundred years later, began to marry people such as me, a crazy person that's from the British Isles. And, uh, you know, I am uh, from an English extract, uh, also Scottish and Irish. And so, you know, I'm a little crazy, and, uh, you know, they, how that goes. And if, but anyway, it was really interesting going and being in that church and just knowing that these people, very, very godly people, and my wife, she said, you know, if we didn't have grandkids, we would move to Hutchinson because the people were so nice and so not only nice, but they weren't hung up on certain things that we are hung up out here in Oregon. And they just relaxed and they just depended on God. And it was really a great experience. And I just wanted to share that with you. So if any of you have relatives or friends back in Hutchinson, believe me, I've met them. They're tremendous people. You know, one of the things I enjoy, I, I am, a, as you know, a pastor, or have been a pastor. I'm retired now, semi-retired, and uh, until I go to another church to work with. But anyway, I will tell you the greatest thing in my life is not being a pastor. The greatest thing in my life is being married to the wife that I'm married to and having children and great-grandchildren, or grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I love being a parent. I love being a husband. I love, I love the good of it and the struggles of it. I love everything about it. I have, you know, four children, one boy and three girls. You've been sure Troy's told you that, and they're not children anymore, obviously. And I have 11 grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. And wow, it is a privilege being in a family and having families is something that's kind of gone out of style in America today. And it's too bad. Because I will tell you, family is everything. You know, I've often wondered why there are so many people that are homeless. Why aren't they, their, parent, their parents or even their brothers and sisters taking care of them? The reason is many people don't get married anymore. They don't have much respect for family. And the problem is, that's what the problem is with our country. It's not politics. We, we claim, claim it's politics. politics. Oh, yes, we've got different politicians that are evil and stuff like that. That's what has happened since the beginning of time. But you know what the real problem in this country is? It's the disintegration of the family. Now, think about that. When was the last time you sat down at a meal with your children with a TV not on? When was the last time you uh, didn't know whether your kids were going to come home at night because they were doing some of their activity? 
You see, it used to be when I was growing up that we gathered around the table and the meal was always at 5.30. Now, when we went out for sports, my mother, what she would do, she would fix a plate and put it on the stove and, and wait for us to come. And stuff. But anyway, I'll tell you what, it was family and we talked. The TV wasn't on. We, we just shared with each other. We joked with each other. We ate with each other. And it was a great time. But how many of you eat together anymore with your families? We don't. Very seldom. Thanksgiving and Christmas, if you're lucky. And so what happens is, is we have really disintegrated the family. But I will tell you, the one thing I appreciated when I was in, Minnesota, or in, uh, in Kansas is the fact is that they, we all worshipped around family. Family was very, very important to those people there. I got invited out to more dinners, and I gained more weight than I wanted to, and I'm on a diet for the last two months to get back to normal. But being in a family, being a parent, being a father, you know, here's something I read that I thought was rather interesting. You get to be immortal as a father. You get another branch added to your family tree, and if you're lucky, a long list of limbs in your obituary called grandchildren. You get education in psychology, nursing, criminal justice, communication, and human sexuality that nothing can match. And in the eyes of a child, you rank right up there with God. You have all the power to heal a boo-boo, scare away the monsters under the bed, patch a broken heart, police a, sl a slumber party, ground them forever, and love them without limits. So one day you will be like love without coming, counting the costs. It's worth every minute. Being a family is unbelievable. I cannot tell you, since I've come back from Kansas, I have gone to five baseball games, in, uh, college ba baseball games, and I've gone to three, four high school baseball games. I've gone to track meets. I've gone out to lunch. And by the way, have you noticed whenever you take your grandkids out and they're teenagers, you know, I know we live in an inflation type of situation, but it's rather interesting today because when you take them out, I took out two of my grandkids last uh, summer before I went to Kansas, and it cost me $42 because they are double everything except the milkshakes. You know, and it, so I, I took, good night. I hate to take them out now because it'd be $84 with all the inflation going on. But I want to deal with you today on something that's very important. A passage of scripture is called the Shema. Moses has taken the people out of Egypt. And now they're getting ready after 40 years of walking in the desert. Now they're getting ready to go into the promised land. And he now writes this chapter here called the Shema, as I said. And he gives, I think, eight principles within this passage. And there's somebody, they can, they can come along another pastor and they can come up with nine or ten and some could only come up with three. But anyway, we're going to look at what those principles are. The first principle you're going to look at is biblical truth must be obeyed. If we're going to have families, we need to understand we must have truth and it must be based upon the word of God. It's important, and in what we have today in our country, we don't have anything we base anything on except everybody's opinion. And if your opinion offends people, oh, that's terrible. But the reality is, we need to understand that we are Christians, and we live according to the word of God. And Moses is saying to the people there, he says, listen, biblical truth must be obeyed. And listen to this. He says, now this is the commandment. There are three key words here, and one of them is the word commandment or command. Five times it's mentioned in this passage, one through nine. Five times. These are my commandments that I want you to follow. Now, do you think they're suggestions? No, they're not. He is saying if you're going to be successful with a family, you need to what? You need to follow what I'm telling you. He goes on to say, he says, not only commandments, these are statutes. These are laws. And these are judgments, and I want you to follow them, which the Lord your God commanded. I'm going to tell you something. Do you think God wrote the Bible as just be suggestions? You know, the Ten Commandments are not the Ten Suggestions. You've heard that phrase before. But there are truths that will help you to live effectively in life. The next word, command, or the word commandment says, I have something for you to obey. Even Jesus said in John 15, 10, 
Keep my commandments. If you're a follower of Christ, you will follow what Jesus teaches. And then at the same time, time as we go into verse one we look at the word observe we circle that word circle the word commandments or commanded and then, then then circle the word observe what does that mean in james it says prove yourselves doers of the word not merely hearers who delude themselves be people who observe the word of god it's you know observing it's not just looking at what the word of God says, but it means actually to do what God's word has to say. Observe to do it. You know, see, God doesn't tell you to love your neighbor just because it's a good idea. God doesn't cause, tell you to love your children because it's a good idea. He tells you to love your wife. He tells you to love your family. And I want you to understand, we are to observe what God has told us. The next word I want you to look at is found in verse, verses three, 3 and 4. And it's, it says this. It says, hear the word. He's therefore, hear, O Israel. And then you go down in verse uh, 4. It says the same. Hear, O Israel. The word here. You remember raising your children, and especially when they're either junior high or anywhere from 6 to junior high. When they get to be... Uh, teenagers, they leave their brain outside and they don't come back until they're 25. But anyway, one of the things you need to understand, and so when they, sometimes you have to get down on your knee with a little child and he's, he's looking this way, he's looking that way. I, and you're looking at him and saying, hey, look at me. So finally you grab his head. Listen, hear me. I don't want you to punch your little sister again. You know, sometimes we have to do that with people, especially Christians. God is saying, hear what I have to say. Listen, the Bible is very, very important. And if you're going to be one that's going to be a follower of Christ, you're going to recognize that you must obey spiritual truth. God has something to say. God has something for us to do. God has something for us to hear. The second principle that we're going to look at this morning is very important, is biblical truth should be transferable. Now, what does that mean? In other words, if God teaches it that we're supposed to do, then we're supposed to do it. And then after I do it, I am supposed to transfer that to someone else. I am supposed to teach somebody else that truth. And in this case, because he's dealing with family, listen, you're not just parents to have kids to be great football players or to be highly educated. You're not uh, having them to be able to, uh, you know, make you a success. Your job is to transfer biblical truth to them so that when you die, and by the way, I'm going to be 76 next month, and I'm going to tell you something. I'm getting, I've got many, many days behind me than I do ahead of me. And so what I'm trying to say is I'd better start transferring truth. In fact, I should have been doing it all my life, and I have tried to, but transferring truth into the lives of my children and their children. Isn't it interesting? He uses the phrase... He says, fathers and sons and grandsons. Now, I want you to know something. It is great being a father, but it is also great being a grandfather. And I think sometimes we as parents and sometimes as grandparents, you know, uh, grandmothers and grandfathers don't realize the influence that you can have on your children. And we need to transfer biblical truth to our children. And so often we don't do that. We don't translate it into truth. So what happens to them? They're left alone and, and they have to, well, you know, I know many Christians today, many Christians, for some reason, when their kids get to be older and they go out for sports and they're doing activities on Saturday and Sunday, and, and then finally, especially when they get into high school, even the parents don't come to church anymore. Then when these kids get in there, not kids, but when they are grown and they get in their 20s and 30s, we wonder, why aren't they following God? It's quite obvious. We've kind of checked out. You see, I tell you what, I love, the greatest thing that Troy ever did for me, and it was when he was a sophomore in high school. One of the things he did, I just thought was outstanding. He had gone to church camp. And uh, so when he got back, he said, Dad, I want to talk to you. 
And I was in the kitchen and we had a table there. And he says, no, dad, I said, sit down. I want to talk to you. I said, oh boy, what's this? What did he do now? Steal the church bell or something like that? Or did he and they steal the trumpet or the whatever they're supposed to have out there to let everybody know? And he says, dad, I had a great time at Camp Tadmore this year. Council there was unbelievably good. And he said, you know what? I want you to know. God placed me in a minister's home. He made it easy for me to come to Jesus Christ. Therefore, I have a greater responsibility. Wow. Think about that. Biblical truth got through to him as a sophomore in high school. And I tell you what, you need to get that through your kids and grandkids. Now, some of you grandparents, I want to speak to you very frankly here. Listen, don't go out and spend their inheritance. Your inheritance is them. Your legacy is them. Some of you, some of your kids today won't let you see the kids. I understand that. Some, some, some kids are mentally deranged when they get older. And so anyway, they don't allow you to see the grandkids. But I'll tell you this, you can pray for them. Some of you have gone through divorce and you're saying, well, I don't even get to see my children. And when I do, it's not very good. Listen, make the best of it. But you've got the power of prayer. And I want to tell you something. Those who can visit their grandkids, visit them. Like I said, I went to five track meets or four, three track meets and five baseball games and all that. Why? Did I do much to them? Walk up, sh- sh- shook their hand, gave them a great big hug. A great big hug and I said, sure, good to see you. That's all you need to do sometimes. See, that's transferring your love to them. And that's also transferring, transferring your spirituality. I grew up in a divorced family. My father left home when I was six. But my mother and grandmother had complete impact on my life because they never let us go. And my grandmother used to take me to church on Sunday nights. And I remember that. My mother used to tell me biblical truth and she was a person of prophecy and stuff like this. But I tell you what, you have influence over your family and if there's ever a time in this country, it is now. We need to do it. So I want you to understand the truth is transferable. Biblical truth brings blessing. That's the third one. I got to look at my watch and make sure I get through. I kind of want to keep it in to where Troy does because I don't want him to think that I preach longer than he does. So anyway, biblical truth brings blessing. Listen to verses two and three. Let's go back through that. That you may fear the Lord, your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you to you, you and your sons and your grandsons all the days of your life and your days may be prolonged. There are four blessings here that it may be well with you. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. When you are teaching your children and your grandchildren the things of God and you're doing what God is, uh, wants you to do and you're following the scripture, guess what? Following scripture works out. And when people disobey God, there's an old question you need to ask them. And it's asked all the time. Well, how's it going? Well, not very good. You know? Sometimes when you start to miss worship and you get out of the word of God... Things don't work out. And young people, I'll tell you this. Don't allow your friends to lead you astray. Have guts to stand up for Jesus Christ. Have guts to live by principled life. I want to tell you something. You run, my mother taught me something very, very uh, simple. She says, if the people you run around with, and back then when I was a teenager, they were called hoods. You probably, some of you remember those names? Most of the young people don't know those names. So anyway, they're kind of guys that do the wrong thing. She says, you run around with them. And by the way, my stepfather said the same thing. They said, who you run around with is the kind of people they're going to think you are. You run around with people that drink and swear and do drugs, people are going to think you did it. Well, you said, well, I don't do that. Well, you need to be nice to them. You need to be friendly. That's no doubt about it. You need to witness to them. But I'm going to tell you something. Friends do make a difference. So it may be well with you. If you live in sin, I'm going to tell you something. You sow wild oats. You've heard the expression. What do you do? What do you reap? Wild oats. Simple as that. And number two, blessing of a prolonged life. Now, do I understand that? There's some reason that when I live according to God, when I do things the way I should, then my life lasts longer for some reason. He seems to add years. That seems to be what he's saying here. 
And just think, wouldn't you like to live a whole life for Jesus Christ? Because when you get to heaven, you're going to get rewarded for living for him. A prolonged life. I will tell you this. If you drink too much and get drunk, you'll probably get in a wreck. May you even kill yourself. If you end up doing things that are contrary to the word of God, you'll get in trouble. It always works that way. Now, there are a few exceptions in the Bible. John the Baptist died at 31, but that's all God wanted him to do is to present the Messiah. Stephen, he died at a very young age, and that was God's purpose for him. Jesus, of course, was only about 34 when he was crucified. But as a whole, you and I have been put on this earth in a chaotic world to be witnesses to others. And so he prolongs your life. And then, of course, another thing, the third thing he gives, that it may be well with you, well-being. You know, people that live according to the biblical truths are much more grounded and not flaky. Does that make sense? When you have something to live for, when you have a purpose in life, boy, it's a real comfort. You know, I I couldn't wait. I spent eight months, and I I was really enjoying the ministry. I really was. And they said, you know, you can move back here. I said, no, I got to get to my grandkids. I got to get to my kids. The only reason Didi and I decided not to move back there is because of grandkids and kids, in all seriousness. We wanted to be with our family. Family's important. And yet, look how many people don't even know who their dad is today. Don't even know who their mom is. It's a shame, isn't it? What a world we live in. You know, we have the truth as a church. And that truth is to permeate society. Uh, And then the last one is increase mightily. Oh, man. Increase mightily. The greatest man in in our lifetime was Billy Graham. I don't know what some of you may not have liked him, but I, I love that man. I, and I loved other, other great missionaries and other great people that have served God. Other, uh, some laymen have done so many tremendous, tremendous things for Jesus Christ. It's amazing. Those are my heroes. Some drunken football, football player that takes drugs and all that, he's none of mine. I want a guy that lives for Jesus. Yeah, it's, I really do. I went to a school with a man. His last name was uh, Tebow. Tim Tebow's dad. Tim Tebow's dad was a tremendous and is a tremendous Christian. And how he lived his life is amazing. He was pastoring a small church, but God laid in his heart to go into the Philippines. And uh, today he's, uh, he's sick. But I will tell you this. Tim Tebow's dad went out, reached out in the Philippines, and you know he did evangelistic meetings all through them, and they started churches, hundreds and thousands of churches in the years that he was there. I asked him, I said, how many people have you reached for Christ? He says, over a million and a half. And we started churches. Those are my heroes. And by the way, you need to teach your kids to have heroes like that. All right, as we move on, biblical truth is sound theologically. Listen, here, O Israel... The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. There's one thing that I really think is a real problem today in the church is we don't teach enough on who God is. We start out in the first verse of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? The heavens and the earth. What it means is that God is all powerful. That God is all knowing. It means that God is eternal. It means that God is truth. It means that God is love, that God is good. These are the attributes of God. But very seldom do we ever study the attributes of God of who he is. And our kids really don't even know who God is and what he can do. When I was a a youth pastor years ago, one of the uh, books that I had read, and it just made really a great impact on me, and I was a youth pastor in Minneapolis, and one of the books I took was uh, The Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer. Any of you heard that book? It's a book about the attributes of God. And I read that. And so we studied it as a high school and college group. And we were going into it and saying, what is God really like? Man, it was transforming. That youth group, we grew from just three kids to over 100 kids in junior high and high school and college in, one, in two years. In other words, we studied the word of God. Then, of course, when I got into the seminary, I'd already read the book, J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God, on the attributes of God. 
This last year, I did something that I, I had this great big old thick book that was on my shelf that the professors had told us to read, and it was called Charnick's book and on the attributes of God. Now, I want to tell you something. He was born in 1628, and he died in the 1680s. And this book is written in Old English, and it had 800 and I think 852 pages, maybe a little more than that, but 800, but it was small print. I had to, you know, look at it twice to see, uh, see a passage. And so I began to read it, and I'd read about anywhere from three to five pages a day. I, I made my mind up to read it. And I'm going to tell you something, it boggled my mind. It was one of the greatest books on who God is. Just to think about the eternality of God, that there is no time or space for God. Just the fact to know that he's all powerful and all these are in Christ, our savior. You know, so often what has happened is we don't teach people enough on who God is. Well, we think we know him, but even the apostle Paul writes that I may know him and his righteousness, that I may know him. In other words, that word epikonosko is a word that said that I may not only know him, but I may know him intimately, that I may experience him within my life. You see, we need to know God. And that's one of the things we need to do. So as we look at this, I will tell you this. It's important. A correct view of God is necessary more today than ever before because we have people knocking on our door and when we hear basically the junk that they try to pass around, I tell you what, it is junk. And too many Christians cannot defend themselves and that's not good. Sound doctrine produces sound Christians, people. You cannot get enough of the word and you cannot study enough of the word of God. Number five. Biblical truth is based on love. Verse 5. We look at that. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. With all your heart. The very seat of our emotions, the very, our feelings, and the very things that we love and that we embrace. We are to love God because we are in love with him. I remember when I started going with my wife, Dee Dee. Boy, I really loved her. It was puppy love. I was in high school. She was a sophomore. I was a senior. She was a straight A student. I was going to go to college the next year. I was a couple of years older, and I knew I could uh, do something with that gal. And by going with her, she could help me write my papers. <laughs> so anyway. So anyway, we, uh, you know, obviously we went together four and a half years. This June 8th, we have been married 54 years. Tremendous. Tremendous person. Tremendous person. I love her more today than I ever did the first day I ever met her. But see, we're to love God even more than our spouse. And it's rather interesting. The more you love God, if you're really honest with it, the more you love your spouse. The more you love Jesus and how he forgave you, the more you'll be forgiving of your spouse and your spouse will be forgiving of you, I hope. Seriously. To love God with all your heart, with all your soul. What does that mean? With all your mind, your intellect, your intellect. And then also he says, and with all your strength. Let's ask ourselves, let's be honest. Do I love God more today than I did 10 years ago? Do I love more God more now than the day he saved me? I think sometimes if we look at that, we'll find that we're wanting. I know so many times I do. You see, I must be totally involved in the love of God. And as I'm totally involved in the love of God, I will be totally involved with loving people. I will tell you, you know, a friend of mine said, you know, the ministry is great if it wasn't for people. But the problem is we got to love them. The problem is you got to love them. And there are going to be things done to you. You may have grown up in a home where your father basically abused you. You may have grown up in a home where your mother you couldn't live with and you couldn't wait to leave. Or you may have grown up with some brothers and sisters that for some reason they're just jerks. I don't know what else to call them. I have brothers and sisters. They're not jerks. But I tell you what. You've got to forgive them the way Jesus forgave them. You've got to love them the way Jesus loves them. You got to love them the way Jesus forgave you of your sins. You see, none of us seek after God. No, not one. 
You know, the, this, is, this passage is rather interesting to me. So let's, let's move on. Biblical truth is based on love. Biblical truth is internalized. What does that mean? It means it becomes second nature. It means that I walk around. And by the way, do you realize that when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came into your life? Do you realize that? He that has the Spirit, we know that well, he's a believer. He has the Spirit in him, Romans 8. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Your, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And when you get the word of God in your life, the Holy Spirit works in your life and is full of... You know, when we pray on Sunday morning, do you realize we have a bunch of temples in this building? You. You house the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you something. You take a look at your hands right now. Take a look at your feet. You look in the mirror and do you realize the Holy Spirit of Christ lives within you? And you go back to the attributes of God. Do you realize the power of God is in your life? That's amazing, isn't it? It's an amazing thing to me. And do I understand it? I tell you what, I will think on this throughout eternity because how can you know the mind of God and how can you even know his riches? They're beyond us. Biblical truth is internalized. Biblical truth starts at home. Teach diligently to your sons and their sons. In other words, teach them to the whole family. Israel forgot it. In the book of Judges, it says, then there grew up a generation that did not know God. And then there was a revival. A judge was appointed and then revival came. And then later on, then there was a generation that grew up and did not know God. And then there was a revival. Our country, whether you want to fight it or not, was built upon Christian principles. And if you look back in the 19th century and you look and you find that and you'll see that there were revivals after revivals after revivals. I grew up in the South the first 11 years before we moved to Oregon. And Oregon became my home. But I will tell you this. One of the things, I grew up in a denomination that every so often they'd put out a sign once a year, revival starting. And for the next two weeks, they had, every night you'd come there, there would be some of the best preachers you'd ever hear. Or they'd go out and rent a tent, and, and people would come for miles around. They'd go to the, the tents. Any of you ever experienced that? Raise your hands if they are. Don't be afraid. These people aren't going to bite you. They know you. You're your relatives, every one of you. I wouldn't say anything against anyone here because I might talk to a relative. But anyway, just to let you know. Uh, uh, so I want you to understand something. Those revivals basically brought people back spiritually. When I got into college, I went to a school in Portland, a Christian school. Every year they had a spiritual weekend. Or not a weekend, spiritual week. And they'd bring in top speakers and we would have to examine ourselves where we are spiritually. Why? The Bible says revive us again. Why? Because revive means I've slipped someplace. And the reality is we need to do that. We need to get focused back on God. And he, as I mentioned here, he says, it starts at home. We need to have revival in our home and, and teach our children to walk with Christ. We need to let them know why we walk with Christ, why we love Jesus. They may not buy into it for a while. You probably didn't either. There are problems at times when you probably were rebellious. But they'll learn the hard way. They'll learn the hard way because, well... And then it goes on to say, he says, he says, list several things that are very insightful here. He says, when you're with your family, talk of them when you're in your home. Talk with them at home. Talk with them about Jesus. Talk to them about practical things. Talk to them about life itself. Talk of God, by the way, the Bible says. And when you lie down and when you wake up, you know, the best things my parents ever said to me weren't lectures. But when we were walking or talking or sitting around the table and they said some words that really kind of encouraged you. I remember my mother, one time we were doing dishes and I was going out for wrestling. And uh, I ended up, uh, so I was going to wrestle 98. I guess you couldn't believe that. I wrestled 98 in high school, even though I'm fat now. But anyway, so just to let you know. So anyway, we're sitting there washing dishes and mom was a very godly woman through a lot of struggles in her life. She wasn't perfect, but she was great. And I'm saying, you know, I think I'm going to quit. I mean, quit this diet, and I'm just going to go to another weight class. 
And very nicely, she says, no, don't do that. You're, you're so close. Just go ahead. And I did. And so that year, I had the best season. I, I was third in state as a freshman in high school. I'm not bragging on myself, but it was that encouragement from my mother. And I re- remember other times when the parents just, you knew what to say. You know, sometimes we don't take advantage with our kids. You know, when you go out on a trip and, and you're traveling and, you know, have them look around. And when you stop by the water and the streams and the rivers and look and see the mountains and everything, isn't it wonderful how God has made this? Look, so complicated. Here, you see the trees and you see this and you see that. And wow. Everybody says this happens by accident. No, it doesn't. You see, teach your sons, teach your daughters, teach them things about God in a general conversation instead of just pouring everything with a great big water hose. You understand what I'm saying? Learn to take times, take your kids out, just you and them. Date your daughters. Teach them what a real man's like. Take your sons out. Punch them out once in a while. Show them what a real man's like. <laughs> No, that, so don't buy that. That's not what I'm saying. You know, men, men have a, but I will tell you something. I have some grandsons, and um, one grandson, his, uh, I won't tell you the whole story, but his father doesn't live with him, and he shouldn't. And uh, we go, I go to his baseball games. He's in college now. And by the way, he's already had some pro scouts looking at him because he's a left-handed pitcher. Just a couple of weeks ago, He tells me something. He says, Grandpa, I'm glad you came. He said to me, he says, I started having my devotions in college. I haven't been doing it. You know I haven't been doing it. But he says, I did. I started having them, and things are going better for me. And he says, it's going so well, I think I'm going to start doing it at night too. You see, that took years of being with him and visiting him at his games and taking him places and spending McDonald's at 42 bucks. But I've earned the right. What are you doing? And by the way, let's go a step further. It's not here in the passage. There are kids that come here that don't have fathers. In fact, they don't even know who their mother is. Once you start, you, you older people, once you start adopting those kids. When I was in the ministry uh, at Grace Baptist Church in Salem, a couple of old timers came out to me and said, is it all right for us to take your son in junior high and take him out fishing? Because we know you're in the ministry and busy. And I, and I know that you, you, you're doing good with your son. That's not it. But we, we want to be kind of a adopted grandparents. And I let them do it. Boy, did Troy have a good time with him. He took him, they took him fishing all the time. The only thing they kept doing that he didn't understand is why were they giving him geographical uh, uh, magazines because he didn't want to read them in the junior high. That's the only thing they did. But the final thing I want to get to in the eighth principle is this. Biblical truth is a witness. Look at verses 8 and 9. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on your doorpost of your house and on your gates. When I die, I don't care about the churches I've started or the churches I've ministered into. And don't get me wrong, that sounds like I'm being, you know, casting that down. That's not true, but what I want you to understand. I would rather be known that I'm a father that loved my wife and my children and my grandchildren. For that is my legacy. Nothing else matters. Close with this story. In the 60s, my wife and I got married. It's 1968, and I started seminary. Vietnam War was raging. We had three students from uh, the class below me and the class above her, um, that got killed in Vietnam. There were all kinds of riots that were going on in this country. Pretty bad. You know that. The Ohio, you remember the university in Ohio where people got killed? You, you remember that. Those who have gray hairs, they remember all those things. People burning their draft cards. People 
saying all kinds of slanderous things about our country. And I, th- I talked to Dee Dee and she and I, and we had planned on having children. I said, I don't know if I want to have children. And uh, I said, why bring children in a world like this? And then one day, I had to go to chapel, and the chapel was, was you know, the, at, and when you're in seminary at Western, you had to go to chapel, and, and Dr. Lauren Fisher was uh, preaching. He was the Christian education director. I loved him, had his classes. And that message was for me that day because he says, you know, my wife and I decided to have children. We have eight of them. He said, man, and he says, it's the best thing we ever had. And he says, when we had those children, he says, we knew that if we taught them about Jesus and, and showed them the love of Jesus Christ and, and we nurtured them, then when we die, we would leave a legacy so that they could carry on the ministry of Jesus Christ. Wow. Changed my perspective. As you can guess, four children, 11 grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. That is what I'm proud of. And that's what the Shema is telling us to do. Make your family a family and help them to know God. Shall we pray?